this week on the writer con podcast quota did you say quota quota quota, quota. meaning page <laughs> I, count? I mean i i think making yourself write a certain number of words per week welcome to writer con a gathering place for writers to share their knowledge about writing and the writing world your hosts are william bernhardt best-selling novelist and author of the red sneaker books on writing and renee gutteridge best-selling author of over 30 novels and screenplays. Thank you, Jesse Ulrich, and hello, writers. We're recording this episode a little bit in advance. I'll warn you up front because I've got travel plans. So if some major story has happened in the last couple of days and we don't talk about it, that's why. We'll get there next time, I promise. Renee, it's December now. Have you started getting ready for Christmas yet? It would be crazy if I didn't. So I'm going really? to say yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot to do at Christmas. Decorating and mm -hmm. baking and, do... and shopping. You do all that? You bake? No, I don't. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, and thanks for calling me out on that. Uh, I was Bill, just so impressed. I'm just, sorry. Well, listen, I try. And so. Ooh, then you bake. Well, yeah, that's okay. Okay, Jesse, how about you? Same question, except Hanukkah, right? Yep. Um, there's not really a lot of preparation that needs to be done for Hanukkah, especially if you don't have kids and you're my age. Mm. So it's really just, um, you know, uh, do you ask for a gift from your adult parent as an adult? Uh, which I do usually do. He, he, my dad usually wants to give me something. Um, but yeah, I, now that I own a house that I can actually like put lights up that I could leave there permanently, mm -hmm. I might... And, my wife, who is not Jewish, has convinced me of this. Since Hanukkah is technically the festival of lights, like I shouldn't be fighting against putting up house lights just more in the colors of Hanukkah, which are more blue and white versus uh, green and red. So I might do that. I did not know that. Blue yeah. and white. I yeah. did not know that either. I'm... Um, yeah, I mean, well, really, like it was really just sort of white before, but uh, the state of Israel also adopted blue and white as their colors. Mm -hmm. So it's just like any holiday that needs a color scheme, you just sort of steal that one. Um, <laughs> but... You know, like, like if you ever look at Hanukkah decorations or Hanukkah cards uh -huh. or whatever, or the candles, yeah, there's used, they're always usually blue and white. And I don't know who decided that, but we just all just tacitly agreed to it. So mm -hmm. I might put up some blue and white lights and, you know, uh, maybe write out Happy Hanukkah on my roof. Who knows? We'll see. We'll see how much time yeah. I have. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are going to need an update on this. Is all right. What yeah, I'm yeah, yeah. You know. Next With time. Pictures. Well, today our guest is James Scott Bell, who is, of course, a former WriterCon headliner and one of my favorite writers of both crime and genuinely helpful books about the craft of writing. His latest release is Romeo's Rage, which is the seventh book in his Mike Romeo thriller series. And we're going to talk to him about all of that and more. But first, the news. Okay, one quick story before we get into the two meteor ones. I just wanted to update everyone because we mentioned before Spotify's plans to get into the audio audiobook market, and they've launched that, but unfortunately are having some snags. First of all, uh, and they're not the first person to have snags with Amazon when they're trying to sell apps. The first, the first problem was, of course, if they sell audiobooks, as they plan to do, not to include it in your Spotify subscription, but as an add-on charge. But if they do that within the Apple sold app, then Apple wants a cut. So then they wanted to change to, well, we'll sell them from our website and just tell people on the app, go to our website. Well, Apple wouldn't even permit that. They would not allow Spotify to even explain to users where they can buy an audiobook or listed or anything like that. So negotiations are ongoing, but you heard it from me first. If there's an audiobook you want to listen to on Spotify, go to their website. Okay, news story number two, which has to do with BDMI investing in book.io, which I'm sure you probably already know. No, I didn't. The first ever NFT ebook platform. Book.io is creating this platform for digital ownership in book publishing by putting 
ebooks themselves and audiobooks on the blockchain through this proprietary technology that they have. So readers can own their digital books and sell them if they choose to, creating a secondary market. But here's a nice pro-author twist. It's a secondary market where publishers and authors can still earn money on not only the first resale, but every resale going on into perpetuity. Okay, Jesse, I'm all in favor of authors having additional income streams. I'm tempted to investigate, except the problem is I don't really understand anything about this. <laughs> Could you please explain uh, NFTs and what all this sure. is and why we might want to do it? All right. So NFTs stand for non-fungible tokens. And in essence, they're really like, you remember, have you ever tried to like open up a PDF that's been like locked down? Mm -hmm. due to whatever reason password. yeah password protected or uh, encrypted in some way that's sort of what nfts are they are designed to be owned by one person um and sort of like a piece of art that you would hang up in your house right except it is digital except you can't right? yeah <laughs> yeah except you can't do the things you would want to do with something that you would like want at an auction and while this is a great idea they're a little late to the game because all nft prices and all nft marketplaces have all crashed since mm. um you know sort of with the collapse of uh cryptocurrency over the last couple months and so i don't know if this is worthwhile if, if it's really just using nfts to allow customers to um buy a copy of a book that they can then uh resell and the author will continue to get money that's great uh if it's just another way of encrypting ebooks to a certain platform that could bring authors more money, but more, be more complicated for the consumer. So I am, I'm very, ha I'm also curious to investigate this. It really depends on how they're using it. If it's just the mm -hmm. selling of NFTs of books and audiobooks, I don't think it's going to be that successful because what are you going to listen to it on and what are you going to read it on? Mm. <laughs> but, but it, I mean, they're selling eBooks, but obviously other people are going to have the eBooks. So it's not an exclusive ownership. It's not even really a limited unless it's no. some kind of special. Are they digitally up signing edition. it? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, is it a special edition? Like it would have to be something very unique. And those are two non unique forms of media, I would say. Like an audiobook is an audiobook, unless they're doing something extra. Like maybe you're getting the outtakes, which I think would be hilarious as someone who edits audiobooks. I, the outtakes are my favorite parts. Um, or, yeah, the. Like it's gonna have to be a limited series of something. It can't be like an, uh, mm -hmm. a special individual one for each NFT. That that's too exhausting for the authors to produce. I would think. I this week DC Comics. I think it's well established on this podcast that I'm a comics nerd, and they they started releasing all these comic book NFTs, which are basically the same thing. You can get. You know, older comics that you probably would never buy with actual real money. Although the NFTs weren't cheap and there were like six different tiers of the same Superman number one you could buy. And uh, I'm, I mean, to me though, uh, you, you buy something like that to hold it in your hands and read it. I don't understand the function. And yet I could see on the website that people were buying these things right and left. I mean, I feel like they're, all these NFT things are going to have to come up with a way to allow you to show it to other people. Cause that's really one of the main reasons people buy auctioned items is so right. they can brag about them to mm -hmm. other people. So if it's just hidden and only you can see it, that's not, that removes, I think one of the number one selling point of these, sort of, these sort of things. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we'll continue to report on this story and, and, by the time I understand it, it'll probably be too late to get into it, but <laughs> we'll try and keep you listeners informed. News story number three, man is released from prison after 23 years due to a podcast. Baltimore prosecutors dropped the charges against, you guys correct me on the pronunciation, Adnan Saeed, mm -hmm. Saeed who was yeah. released last month after he spent 23 years in prison on a murder connection. This was the subject of the podcast serial, right? The first season. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. And the, the, the state's attorney is now instructed her office to dismiss charges. He's been cleared by DNA testing 
Renee, you were the one who brought this story to my attention, didn't, didn't you? What's the takeaway here? Well, I, I think a couple. First of all, cereal was what got me into podcasts, and, and my life's never been the same. I think it. I think cereal <laughs> got a lot of people into podcasts, um, and true crime investigative podcasting. Uh, it was excellent. If you if you haven't listened to it, I would suggest listening to it, even if you're a fiction writer. Uh, they did an amazing job of how they rolled out the story. I mean, just pay attention. It's a true story, but how they rolled it out, how, uh, uh, oh, what was her name? Koenig. Uh, Sarah Koenig. The, the, Sarah Koenig uh, did all that. It's really a nice piece of just storytelling in general, uh, uh, true storytelling. But the other thing I wanted to point out is like, my gosh, the power of story, you guys. Yes. Like. Mm -hmm. Wow, like changed a man's life probably is going to have a significant um, impact on uh, these kinds of cases in general. I mean, to see that a guy's life was changed like this over um, this situation where he was falsely accused. And uh, man, I mean, the, I just want to encourage people like don't ever discount the power of telling a story, you know, when he, when they first took this on, this wasn't a known story. People didn't know who this was. They, mm -hmm. they, what they did is they took an, an unknown story, developed a character in a, in a sense, he's of course right. a real person, but they developed this plot line and this character and the story and put it in a way that people would consume. Um, and now they have this huge impact. So Anyway, that was my takeaway from it. Yeah. And as a lawyer, of course, what I'm hearing is if you're wrongfully committed, uh, wrong, wrongfully accused, let's say, of a crime, forget the lawyers, get somebody to do a podcast <laughs> or write well, a book. it's not that far from the truth, right? <laughs> like, I mean, there have been, this is not the only podcast or mm -hmm. um, documentary series that has exposed some right. of this stuff, right? So, I mean, John Grisham was one of them, too. I think. Mm -hmm. Right. Terrific. So, um, yeah. So like, I think, you know, this is, this is more than just like, Oh, that's cool. If you're a writer, it should, should have a impact on you and, and understanding, even if you're writing fiction, by the way, you can write about some of this stuff in fiction and still bring exposure to it. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it Our, also led to my favorite, uh, recent TV show, which is only murders in the building. Which uh, is, really? Yeah, I, mean, I they, love they, that show. Yeah, the Tina Fey character is is supposed to be like an uh, a quasi evil version of Sarah Koenig. Pretty Sarah much. Koenig, uh, right? <laughs> and uh, yeah, and like as a as someone who's in the podcast business, like the amount of PR that podcasts in general got from Serial and the outgrowth of true crime podcasts, like it makes my job easier trying to sell podcasts to companies. I'm like, member Serial, right? And so mm -hmm. it's, at least people have heard about that. I mm -hmm. wish one of my clients wanted to do a true crime podcast because then I could actually, you know, make money from this. But we'll get there eventually. <laughs> Maybe we could add a segment. No, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jesse, take us to the interview. All right. Well, James Scott Bell is a winner of the International Thriller Writers Award and the author of the number one bestseller for writers, Plot and Structure, which I talk about all the time. Love it. He served as fiction columnist for Writer's Digest magazine and has written many best-selling craft books, including Conflict and Suspense, How to Write Dazzling Dialogue, and Write Your Novel from the Middle, which he actually taught at WriterCon, I believe, so that was fun. Mm -hmm. He attended the University of California, Santa Barbara, where he studied writing with Raymond Carver and graduated with honors from the University of Southern California Law School. And a former trial lawyer, Jim lives and writes in Los Angeles. His website is jamesscottbell.com. His latest release is Romeo's Rage Number no. 7 in the Mike Romeo Thriller series. Jim, welcome. Thanks hey, for having me. Nice to see you both. Hey, Jim. We have a traditional first question. And you've been on the podcast before, so you've probably heard but. Who knows? You, your mind might have changed since then. So I'm oh. just going to go with it. If you could give writers one piece of advice, what would it be? Quota. Did you say quota? Quota. 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 Meaning page <laughs> I, count? I mean, <laughs> I, I think making yourself write a certain number of words per week. Now, I used to do a daily quota. 
-hmm. and I set it rather high and I'd get really upset if I didn't meet it and there'd be pressure. So what I've done over the, over time is what I advise writers to do is find out how much you can comfortably write in a week and then make that add 10% to that, make that a weekly goal. So I try to write six days a week, take a full day off to recharge. Mm -hmm. So if I miss a day uh, or something intrudes, I can make it up on other days. And to me, that's so important because you, you look back after several years and you look and say, how did all those books get here? <laughs> and it's because you did that. You showed up, mm -hmm. you did your writing stint. So important. And you learn, you learn when you make yourself go and do the writing, you, you are learning too. So that's always really the number one piece of advice I give to writers. And it's a great piece of advice. So you grew up in and around Hollywood, and I think you're still there. And so how has that has that shaped uh, what you write, your writing style, or anything else? What do you think? Well, <clears throat> yeah, growing up in Los Angeles, which has, of course, a storied history, quote unquote. Um, <laughs> and Hollywood, where my, my dad grew up, uh, I just, it's the best, to me, the best noir suspense crime city uh, in the world in terms of setting. There's so many settings, so many nuances, so many neighborhoods, and so on. And it, it, I've always loved the history of the place. So it inspires me. Uh, I saw most of my books are set here. And uh, I, I continue to love it. I love, uh, you know, there's challenges we all know to cities and so on. But, you know, we're close to the ocean. My wife and I left the 20 minutes away and go sit on the beach mm. and, and find food and all of those things as well. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's part of me and, and hopefully I'm part of it. <laughs> well, so... I stumbled upon a book of yours uh, that I didn't realize you'd written, and I'm looking forward to reading it. Uh, and I gotta read the I gotta read the title because it's kind of long for an old brain like mine. Some people are dead. Part essay, part memoir, parts unknown. And this is a book in which you ponder the question of life and death, um, and how how we all know we'll die but sometimes we think we're going to be the exception. Uh, I, it is so true. Um, so I've got to know what prompted uh, you to write this book. This is one of my favorite books, by the way. Uh, hmm. I like writing quirky nonfiction. Um, now, my writing books are, are serious, but I love doing essays and kind of exploring different areas, kind of like Ray Bradbury used to do on the, on the side. Well, one of my favorite writers uh, growing up was uh, William Saroyan. He's kind of not known as much today as he was back in the 30s and 40s. He was a Pulitzer Prize winner, uh, wrote wonderful short stories. And he was just uh, a guy who, who loved writing. Writing was his life. So later in, in his later years, he would just put out these collections of essays. And he put out this book that was so quirky. It's called Obituaries. And all he did was he took the Hollywood, um, the vari variety, the list of celebrities who had died that year. And he just went through the names, whether he knew them or not. He just started writing. What does this name mean? And wh what, what uh, uh, bunny trail do I follow? It was just so amazing. So I decided to do that. I went through Obituaries uh, for, for a year. Just some people I knew, some people I didn't, and I would write little mini essays about them, however they came out. And I, people seem to really respond to it because you know you can read these in short bits and so on. But it's kind of an insight into you know my thinking on so many things, and I just enjoyed doing it. And it was it's so amazing because that that's the kind of book that would never be published traditionally uh, anymore unless you were a, a celebrity of of some sort. But I was able to do it. So happy it's there. Well, in addition to that, you have also written 
among other things, legal thrillers, a genre you and I are both very fond of. But unlike me, you have written zombie legal thrillers. Uh, <laughs> you want to talk to us a little bit about Mallory Kane and all that? What's going on there? Well, <clears throat> back when the zombie craze, uh, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies and the, that sort that stuff was mm -hmm. happening. I thought to myself, how can I do some kind of genre mashup on this? And it, it occurred to me that the zombies were always the monsters. I thought, why don't I make the zombie a hero? And further, all right, I write legal thrillers. Let's make the zombie a lawyer. And because, you know, out here in L.A., the people really can't tell the difference between zombies and lawyers. So <laughs> I thought that's perfect. Uh, and I, I uh, sat down with my agent uh, one evening at a conference and we just kind of hashed this back and forth that this this uh, lawyer would be someone who represents the supernatural characters floating around L.A., like vampires and werewolves and. Like in one of the books, uh, there's a werewolf trying to get custody of his kids. Um, we thought about Frankenstein's monster being denied health of a pre-existing condition. You know, those sorts of things. <laughs> no doubt. And it, tur it turned into a three-book series. I, I did it under a pseudonym. It was published by Kensington. Um, and the first one was called Pay Me in Flesh. <laughs> but then uh, I got the rights back and I published them under my own name now. So a lot of fun. I really enjoyed those. Sweet. That's fun. Yeah, that's that that's super quirky. And I love I hope that inspires our listeners to, you know, think outside the box in yeah. some of this because there's a lot of boxes you can easily fit into when you think outside the box, you stand out. Um okay, so you've also in the past you've written historical legal dramas. Um and that's about the time I think you and I met was when you mm -hmm. were writing those. And uh I would like to hear about sort of, well, first of all, I would imagine you love research if you're going to do historical. Uh, tell us about how you did the research, even how you organized research for something like that, if you did. Um, and I just also want to mention, before you answer that question, how much I love how many female protagonists you have uh, through the years in your books. So anyway. Go ahead. I just had well, to. I just had to insert that. I'll take that. I'll take that. Um, yeah. When I again, um, we, were, you know, I was doing legal thrillers. This is back around two thousand, and I wondered about how to do a legal thriller in another kind of genre, and I thought about <clears throat> a historical legal thriller, and one of the eras that is really not covered in much historical fiction that I could find is turn of the century Los Angeles uh, from 1800s to the, to the 1900s when the city was moving from kind of this wild West vibe to an actual urban environment. And the courtrooms were really like the wild West because, you know, there was <laughs> all kinds of, you know, courtroom things you could do that you can't do now. And, there were some legendary lawyers like Earl Rogers who practiced and so on. And I thought, oh, what about a woman wanting to practice law in those days? And of course, that was extremely rare. Uh, really, probably just maybe half a dozen you could name in the early part of the 1900s. So I thought, what a great uh, setting and what a great uh, era to have a young woman wanting to practice law in Los Angeles at that time. And again, I love the, the history of the city. There's so much there. So I did. I spent a lot of time at the downtown library going through microfilm of, you know, the old times and examiner and so forth. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I have two huge binders right here of the uh, material I came up with, you know, copies and so forth. So extensive research. And, uh, you know, it was so interesting because as the more, the more deeply I got into it and then I would walk, you know, I would walk downtown the same streets that my, uh, hero would have walked is that I got so into it that I started to almost have daydreams. Like I was right walking. She was right in front of me and I'm walking, following her, 
it was really kind of weird but wonderful uh the, <laughs> mm -hmm. the smells and everything anyway it, it was just a way for me to dive into that and uh eventually produced six books in the kit shannon uh series hmm. and before we leave this discussion of your multi-faceted multi-genre something like multifarious i don't know your work N nefarious <laughs> yes tell us about the uh mike romeo series your most recent book is romeo's rage right uh yes it is uh i wanted to do a classic lone wolf character um not not necessarily a, a pi but you know i love raymond chandler and you know mickey spillane and Travis McGee, you know, those, all those, um, kinds of that kind of genre. And, uh, again, I figured what, you know, LA is such a great place for this to, to occur. And so I conceived of a character, gave him a backstory, which is, uh, kind of unique is that he is a child genius. He was admitted to Yale at the age of 14 and, uh, he's just incredibly classically trained, but there's something that happened uh, to him that changed the trajectory of his life um which uh, i want to uh tip off but right. that that makes him into this character who's now living in los angeles kind of you know uh off the grid with uh, with his best friend who is a, a rabbi lawyer who is a former Mossad agent who is kind of his benefactor and they work together and uh from there the plots go on there's plenty of action and their action plots but they're written in first person which i love and mm -hmm. try to give him a, a unique voice and um yeah so um th they're going great guns and i'm gonna keep doing them mm. okay something else i want to hear about speaking of how innovative you are you've even got an interactive app right what's that about yeah uh well i've got a couple of things you know i've got a a, a course out from what used to be called the great courses now called right. wondrium it's a full-on right. writing course mm -hmm. um then uh i've also got a course of videos uh available on my website and then uh there is an an interactive app which is called knockout fiction and it's it's found at the site called hive word h-i-v-e-w-o-r-d hive word dot com and it's a one-time purchase and what it is is it walks you through from you know just i germ of an idea all the way through to a finished novel giving you interaction giving you exercises to do so that you can follow it and create your novel with characters and scenes and all of that um and kind of using the templates that uh, that have helped me that i've developed so uh, a lot of writers that I've heard from really like it. It's just it's mm. it's a way to do your novel, let it let it interact with you, you with it. It's like having a writing coach with you. Mm. Yeah. So thanks for asking. Great idea. That's really cool. So you're one of the most prolific writers I know, um, and I think everybody would love to hear what your writing day looks like. It, when does it start? When does it end? How do you know which thing to work on, where, when? How do you organize yourself in eight hours and go to the beach? <laughs> <laughs> well, I get up really early when it's still dark. I, I, I love that. Uh, you know, get the coffee going and, you know, kind of get, get the day rolling. My wife joins me. We have a little quiet time together. And I try to make writing like the first thing I do, the first big thing I do during the day, I try to get the, get started on my quota. Um, because if I know that if I get a good start, no matter kind of what happens the rest of the day, I'm, you know, I'm that much uh, ahead. Uh, and again, I try to write, uh, you know, my thousand words, which is kind of my daily quota. Um, and I generally start by rereading my previous day's work kind of very slightly don't make major edits but i will edit a little a bit of it and that gets me back into the flow of the story <clears throat> and so then i write and and i do that and uh and 
once once I finish my quota, if I'm going good, I'll keep I'll keep going for a while. But then I have other projects. I like to have multiple projects going so that I can kind of switch my brain over. Hmm. So uh, I might go over and work on uh, a new nonfiction. I might go over here and work on some short stories, um, whatever kind of I've got my project board lined up knowing what I'm doing. And then I always have <clears throat> at least my next novel. I always have that in development, kind of like a movie studio. Renee, you would know all about that in development. <laughs> and uh, can last there forever. <laughs> I know. Fortunately, it's not development hell because I'm in charge. So I always, um, you know, I'll have I'll be doing notes. I'll be doing maybe a, a, a little scene here and there, character sketches and so forth. So that's really, you know, I want to keep that hamster wheel going and so generally i do that that's my morning um early afternoon is zombie time i mean i'm uh, my creative juices aren't flowing um and then i'll probably do some business things then maybe some marketing things um then a little bit in the late afternoon and and then i'm done hmm. you have been very successful in both the traditional and the independent publishing worlds. Can you talk about that? What are your opinions on both? Well, um, I, I was very content and happy in traditional publishing. I worked with some great houses, some great editors, and of course got my start and built up, built up from there. Um, when the independent publishing what do you want to call it? Revolution, disruption was really <laughs> taking off, yes. you know, around 2010, 2011, when, you know, people were really reporting great things. Um, I kind of stuck my, my toe in and was kind of surprised at uh, how much the, uh, the water covered my toe. I mean, it was actually, it was pretty amazing thing that you could do this. Mm -hmm. And uh, when it came time to decide on going with another contract, I just finished one, um, or trying to be independent for a while, I decided to go independent and see what would happen. And as a result of that, I got a lot of my rights back to previous books, which is a tremendous um, thing to have. But then I started producing the new stuff. And I've been quite happy here, um, you know, just in terms, you know, monetarily, also creatively, also the speed with which you can publish something. You know, you finish a book, you don't have to wait a year, year and a half before right. it appears. Mm -hmm. um, so I have I have nothing uh, bad to say about traditional publishing. Uh, it has its own challenges for writers, and it, you know, in this changing marketplace and shrinking bookstores and so forth there are there are challenges there too but uh i i'm just i'm amazed really i mean 15 years ago um you know 20 years ago to think that writers could actually do this mm -hmm. i mean there was self-publishing right. you, you had mean. to pay yeah you had to pay a lot of money for books that would sit in your garage Right. But now it's a real thing. And it's like, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of, I'm still uh, <laughs> amazed by it. And it's just, but you've got to approach it like a business. You know, one of the things I think that I did right was immediately, because I've run businesses before, was to sit down, come up with a business plan and not just start, you know, throwing things out there. Uh, to To make a go of it, you've got to think of it in business terms, um, there are ways to do it. I wrote a book called How to Make a Living as a Writer. And in that book, I give kind of a simple business plan for, for doing this. But you've got, you've got to have that approach, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's very smart. And that's hard for a lot of writers. Business yeah. and plan uh, and the creative brain. Is sometimes yeah. we have to really work at it. So it's nice that you have that in your book where we, we could just copy yours and just go for it. But that's uh, yeah, I do not, it. not it's not <clears throat> a lot of writers like you said Renee um, get uh, goosebumpily when they uh, hear about 
you know, business things and, and uh, kind of that, um, you know, uh, left brain thinking. But the principles are not that hard to understand and, and implement. So if you just give yourself some time, I think you can make a go of it. So anyway. Well, I think that, you know, the, the bigger word there besides business is plan. And you have to plan as a writer or you're just going to be all over the place. So it's good, a good muscle to start learning now, um, mm -hmm. for, especially for the heavily right brained folks like myself. Um, but you can't you just can't be willy nilly, no matter if you're in traditional publishing or independent. Neither one of those work with just the right side of your brain. Just, you know, yeah. just tilts it over all the time. You got to be right. able to think through plans. So um, and I have a follow up question real quick on that. You know, you started in traditional, went over to independent. Do you think that plan, that course of action, starting in traditional, getting a reader base, et cetera, help the success in independent publishing? Or do you think now with independent publishing being so huge and and uh, all that it offers, somebody could just go straight in to independent publishing and do as well uh, mm. without the traditional publishing start? <clears throat> That's a really good question. Uh, in my case, uh, I had the years of building up a reader base that helped me tremendously when I started with indie because I had you know an email list, I had a fan list, all, all of that, and I had I had backlist books to to put up. Um, I these days, you know, in traditional publishing, they're not really nurturing new writers like they used to. I mean, you, you've mm -hmm. got to be able to come out of the box pretty big to continue to publish uh, with a big with a big publisher. There are smaller publishers. Uh, that's That might be, so. you know, I haven't really uh, explored that with people, but there are a lot of boutique publishers out there now that can help new writers and it might be a way to get, get started yeah. that way. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the model now is that when a traditional publisher is going to take on a new writer, <clears throat> I mean, a big publisher, they want to know that that's going to be a big hit. They want it to be. Now, they don't always know how to make that happen. I mean, it's um, the the business is quite notorious for not knowing how to guarantee <laughs> a hit. Um, right. And. But if a, if a really good writer gets a contract and the book doesn't sell real well, they're liable to be um, not given the backing and the nurture and the time that they would otherwise need. And then you've, they've given the rights to that book to the publisher and, mm -hmm. and usually can't publish it themselves for many years. So yeah. I think if, you're, if a young writer is um, studious about it and puts their writing through a grinder. In other words, you've got to you've got to produce a piece of writing that you're you've been tough with yourself, mm -hmm. that you've uh, gotten editing, that you've gotten feedback, that you've really uh, worked as if you were going to uh, submit it to a, a big publisher. If you've done that, then I think and you're able to keep doing it, I think you have a, <clears throat> a chance to to uh, get a foothold in, in independent publishing. That's good. That's good advice. Well, I uh, I remember a character that you created years ago, um, a basketball playing nun. <laughs> Gee, where did, where did I get that idea? I don't know. Uh, it's a great story if you want to tell it. But my question to you is... Um, Give us some tips. Give a, give our listeners some tips on um, creating interesting characters. You're known for that, uh, and you know not all thriller and suspense books have interesting characters. Sometimes they're so plot heavy you forget there's a character involved. What do what are your tips for being able to do both, creating really interesting characters, whatever genre you're in, um, along with everything else that has to go in. That's a big question. Uh, <clears throat> you know, creating characters is very important. Um, you know, I always start with a, I, I need to get the feeling of the character. Um, I don't sit down with a list of questions, you know, to fill out hair color, this, that, and the other. What I want 
is is a visual to do something to me and i also want to hear the voice of the character <clears throat> because if they are are speaking if when they start speaking in a uh di in dialogue that is doesn't sound like me then i'm starting to hear another character so i usually start off by figuring out you know kind of the general outline of a character that i want you know age and so forth and then i try to find a picture that that pops out at me you know i used to cut pictures out of magazines you know people magazine and so forth and have this box of mm -hmm. pictures to try to get something that uh gave me a picture in the character but you can go on the internet now and find <laughs> any kind of profile you want mm -hmm. and so I, I i usually look at a bunch of uh faces until i see one that goes wow that's interesting that's interesting um and it makes me think this might be a a, a real character and then i do a voice journal where I'm, it's a free form document where I'm just typing as if the character is talking to me and I might prompt him with questions. And I keep going until start, suddenly he starts to talk like a, a, a real character, not, not me forcing anything. Mm -hmm. So it starts to have the character come alive. Mm -hmm. And then you try to add, I think, a few details that are unique. Um, uh, I especially love doing this with uh, minor characters, minor or secondary characters are often throwaways by writers or they're cliches and they just, they walk on stage and they do a cliche thing and then they're gone. These are opportunities to really spice up mm -hmm. a scene. And so <clears throat> I will spend a lot of time trying to come up with um, characters that are kind of quirky, that are kind of surprising in, a, in, in how they look and in how they speak. And if you just give that some time, uh, you, you'll you'll begin to develop a, a muscle that does that for you. Mm -hmm. um, so that's you know that it's not a real secret. It's just a, a matter of learning to work with your imagination on coming up with uh, ideas for characters. Mm. Sounds exactly right. So what are you working on now? What can readers expect from you next? Well, I am, of course, working on my next Romeo, and I'll always be working on the next Romeo. <clears throat> I've also got uh, a new writing book that, I, that I'm working on that I'm kind of excited about. Um, and part of it's going to include a look into James Scott Bell's secret notebook. Uh -oh. um, <laughs> I, uh, when I started trying to learn how to write, and this was back in 1988, you know, I um, I studied like crazy. I read books I, and I took copious notes on what was working for me, what I learned, what my process was, and then I'd revise it. And I had this big notebook of my notes throughout those years. So I thought, you know, they, they were helpful to me. And I went back and looked at them again. I thought, oh, that's a really good tip. So mm. I'm going to publish a bunch of those uh, as well as some other things that have helped me along the way. So. I love doing I love doing and teaching uh, writing because um, the craft is just so amazingly fun and and rewarding and I love helping writers get better and so I'll keep that'll be another track that I'll always be on. That's fantastic. Hey Jim, it's always great to see you. Thanks for coming back to the podcast. Wow. Well, it was great to see you and uh, man, how's uh How's Oklahoma? Cold. Still there? <laughs> yes, but still it's there. Cold. We're expecting a <laughs> snowstorm on Monday. Okay, wow. It's freezing in LA. It was like 68 this morning. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you're wearing a sweater, right? <laughs> T-shirt. Anyway, uh, all right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, Jim. Thanks for coming. All right. And it's not too late to join the WriterCon Facebook group either. Do it today and join us. Learn what happens in between the podcasts on Facebook, all right? Until next time, keep writing. And remember, you cannot fail if you refuse to quit. We'll see you next time. <laughs>